Have you ever driven by one of those grass-turfed medians between an oversized parking lot and a horribly bland road and thought to yourself, wow, what a nice two meter wide area of green space. It really contributes to a sense of peace and natural beauty in the area. I wish there were more treeless, desolate strips of grass separating businesses and buildings from one another. Yeah, neither have I. You know what, said some probably American planners shortly after the Second World War? Everyone should have their own house. And those houses should be far away from the road, because the road is a busy, fast-paced, and scary place. And between those houses and the road should be nothing. Nothing at all except for Kentucky bluegrass, grass which is so orderly, so scientifically manicured, that it could be confused for a golf course should someone forget that people actually live here. Or maybe a football field, because it better be big enough to have room for two makeshift end zones for that one time a year when a ball is tossed around at Thanksgiving. And everyone should have their own dedicated motorized vehicle with which they are obliged to preserve this testament to humankind's power over nature. Okay, that was a bit harsh. The reality is that many people simply think this is what success looks like. A big house on an even bigger plot of land which forces you to keep a distance to better appreciate the bigness of the house. That's what we've been trained to think as a result of the great experiment of suburbanization that occurred in post-war America in the 1950s. But it's been 70 years and we need to start thinking outside of the box again. If you want to expand the way you think about your world, Skillshare is the platform- Nah, just kidding. I don't have nearly enough subscribers to pull that off just yet. But maybe you can change that. Anyway, if you live anywhere in this general vicinity and have ever ventured outside of the downtown core of your city, big or small, you have probably at some point driven around in a neighborhood that looks something like this. But don't be hasty, suburbia has gotten a bad rep for many reasons, and if you're watching this channel you are probably already aware that car-centric suburbs are often rather dysfunctional from an economic and social perspective, and you probably find them as boring as I do. But what I want to talk about now is, well, aesthetic. This is really just my opinion, and I confess that I haven't exactly done research on the topic. I'll be the first to admit that I have been in many a nice looking suburb. There are suburbs with magnificent trees, quiet ambience, and architecturally sensible homes. Although I should confess at this point in the channel that I know absolutely zilch about architecture. Let's be honest though, neither I nor many of you could afford to live in a place like this. Most affordable suburbs are exceedingly boring and provide little more visual stimulation than the sides of your local Costco. You can feel the aesthetic similarity between this and this. And I truly believe a lot of that blandness comes from the empty lawns. I mean, just look at these properties which literally oppose one another on a single street. Alternating concrete and grass which doesn't do much for anyone. Or... Interesting frontage which provides shade for both pedestrians passing by and the people who actually live there. And these lawns and houses are actually quite quaint and reasonably sized, in comparison to the gargantuan fields of a contemporary suburban development. I'm no naturalist, but I'd wager that this kind of environment is a lot friendlier to birds and insects than this lawn. I'm also not Tom Ford, but I'd wager that most people agree that this is a hell of a lot prettier than the sterile look of many suburbs. As with most ridiculous suburban practices, it's not really the fault of people who live in these suburbs or even the developers who build them. The nonsense is usually built into the law. In Burlington, Canada, for instance, the floor area ratio is capped at 45%. This means that a maximum of 45% of a given lot area can be covered by a building. An asinine rule which forces most people into having a lawn, unless you happen to be a fairly keen gardener. Furthermore, this rule alone basically prevents any form of missing middle housing from being built effectively. Constraining people's living conditions into such absurdly simplistic criteria is just patronizing. We haven't even spoken about maintenance yet. Lawns bring with them the worst kind of maintenance. Mowing a lawn isn't intimate and methodical in the way that gardening is. Yet, in their own way, lawns are sort of high maintenance, especially because they are often made up of grass that doesn't grow naturally in the region. I'm looking at you, Kentucky Blue. Massive lawns were once the property of lords, with many peasants to do the hard work of maintenance. This manual labor has been replaced with noisy leaf blowers, noisy lawn mowers, 
pesticides, and those laughable aerator things, which have to be one of the most unnecessary inventions on the planet. Do yourself a favor, plant some trees and forget about them. The most obvious and aggravating flaw of lawns, however, is that they are unproductive wastes of land. How many people do you actually see making use of their lawns on a given day in a suburb? Most of them just sit empty 99% of the time. Even when people sit out to enjoy the admittedly tranquil vibe of some suburbs, they usually do it on a porch or something, not in the middle of their huge lawn. By the way, that's part of a phenomenon called thigmotaxis, which I have to mention because it's a really cool word and you should look it up. Maybe I'll do a whole video on thigmotaxis and urbanism. Anyway, lawns were originally an instrument to show off the disposable wealth of some random European royal. Like, hey, look at all this land I purposefully don't grow food with, or use for anything at all now that I think of it, just because I can. Massive lawns push us all farther away from one another. Some people might like that, but we should also encourage tighter pack development for those of us who want it. When it was just the rich people in the countryside with lawns, the city itself could still function. But when you have entire cities that are like 55% lawn, you start to really inhibit any efficiency. Some people want Kowloon level density everywhere they go. <clears throat> but I'm not advocating for that. Just let people have quaint houses close to the street. Add some interesting greenery that beautifully and effectively separates private from public as people wish. When it comes to public green space, I have two pieces of advice. First, stop with these uninspired, idle slabs of grass. Either put in a bike lane to make it useful, or just take it out altogether. These strips of lawn are cringy afterthoughts that just make roads bigger. No one can actually use this space. It's just an expensive way of giving cars their own lanes, which they can now speed in without consequences. Not every road needs to be built like a runway, with copious amounts of space to either side. Second, if you're going to do it, do it right. Central Park is a legendary case of consolidated green space. It's accessible to thousands, if not millions of people, and it's a masterful example of making public space count, in a city which thrives off of its density and urbanity. When we put our resources together, and yes, that means paying taxes, we can build some astonishingly gorgeous places. Part of what makes public parks and gardens so vibrant is the fact that people are welcome there. At the end of the day, it's the people that make a city what it is, and our green space should reflect that. Please do like and subscribe for more videos about how to make our cities better so that they can make us better.